that is no longer ask the question, we have a technology, we have a solution, what problem can it solve? But really go first understand the problems that people have and enterprises have. And let that influence and define the kind of experience we're designing for, the kind of solution that will deliver that experience end to end, how that breaks down into systems, how that breaks down into platforms and components and so forth. Again, the result you end up getting very often is different if you follow this process and often better surprising than if you continue just thinking about what can we do with the next chip if we just look at the, the chip level. So quite a bit of work going on at Intel in this room. So in many ways you can think about the upper scale of that human value scale as to trying to understand what do we want to make possible. Possible in the mind of the consumer, in the hands of the consumer. What problems are we solving? What benefits are we providing? And only after we've done that will we ask the question, well, what does it take collectively as an ecosystem to deliver that? What do we have to make in order to make that possible for consumers? And then, again, given the unique nature of our industry, it takes an ecosystem these days to deliver just about anything. And of course, the bottom pieces is what we care about most, but without the complementing pieces, the whole solution isn't there. Five without content isn't a complete solution, and so forth. So, what Windows done is import different skills. Now, I'm an engineer by training, although I sort of made a shift about 12 years ago by realizing there must be more to engineering or more to problem solving than the engineering approach. There must be a way to identify the right problems to solve. But as an engineer, you're pretty much trained to look inward and look towards the implementation. Engineers are very uncomfortable when they're not solving a problem. And the question is, well, are you even solving a relevant problem? So what we've done is we've imported people, and this is sort of the place where Genevieve Wells work fits, that actually are trained to look outwards towards the users. They are skilled in understanding and finding problems to go solve that are actually worthy of solving. So they find the needs, they find the problems. What we haven't talked about at length before with the press at all is how we link those two worlds together. And if you don't link them together, you have essentially ethnography work generating interesting insights about people that leads to motivation. And you have engineers that have no way of consuming those insights about people. So the missing link is this whole translation layer that takes those identified user needs, latent user needs, and translates those into what we call user experiences. In other words, what is the benefit that we'd like to deliver to those needs in a way that sort of keeps the user in that description of what we're trying to make possible? Only then can you sort of translate that down to technical requirements and say that from an engineering viewpoint, this will drive workloads, this will drive bandwidths, this will drive um, quantified technical requirements that can be traced back, essentially, to that user experience, back to that underlying user need. So this is sort of transformation that Intel has been undergoing relative to bringing user-centered innovation in our thinking, in our culture. What this relates to is there are no kids on the block. Traditionally, you probably think about it, about it especially at IDF, at predominantly an engineering community. That's probably still the case. There's still a majority of engineers in the company because that's where most of the work is done. You've heard about the ethnography and the social scientists, which is now an established science and discipline at Intel. What we've also done is hire what we call interaction designers and industrial designers. And they are the people that are trained in understanding the human relationship to experiences and artifacts that can take those identified needs, translate them into something that is worthwhile making possible. And that ends up generating requirements for us and our platforms. So another way to think about this, we're sort of now integrating the usage viewpoint in everything we talk about in the company. Traditionally, and engineers will talk about the engineering side and then there's marketing, otherwise known as the dark side. We've added a third circle to that essentially conversation called the usage circle. And engineering typically, we worry about making things possible, making sure they come out of our fans, making sure that uh, technology works, that the manufacturing is cost effective, the yields are good, and those kind of questions. Marketing looks at economic models about profitability. Can we market this to our customers? Can we put things that are affordable? What the usage circle adds is a heightened viewpoint that asks questions about usefulness, usability, and desirability. Usefulness deals with what is the perceived benefit of a certain device or a certain solution to that user that might be interested in it. Usability has to ask the question, assuming that there's benefit there, can we deliver it in a way that mere consumers can actually get to and understand? Which is definitely an issue with high-tech products which tend to be overloaded with features. 
How can we simplify things and still deliver the benefit? And finally, desirability is this concept <clears throat> that sort of comes back to the reptilian brain. It's why people are attracted to some things that you can't really rationalize, but you sort of know that that's the device you want or that's the brand that you lost after, and those kind of things. So this is a way to sort of deconstruct the human viewpoint. So what the usage viewpoint brings into conversation is a fundamentally new way of putting deep textures and insights upon what people find useful, what they find useful, what they find desirable. And that's where techniques that aren't typically classified as marketing research techniques, they're really the user-centered research techniques and design techniques fall into that bucket. So it becomes a very explicit and new conversation change from the company. And the, of course, the objective is to find the center of those three, three conversations. Right? Each in isolation is insufficient to create commercial success. It's nice to have a good technology idea, but unless there's a real benefit for human beings or mankind, it's not going to sell. Even if you have those two, if there's no economic model, not just for Intel, but for the whole ecosystem that's collectively delivered those things, we're not really able to, to create any value for the companies who are doing these kind of things. So this has proven a very useful, sim very simple model to kind of explain what this whole user-centered movement within the company is changing into the conversation. Now, to be honest, you can take a dart and throw it at this map, and innovation and new ideas can start just about anywhere in this constellation. We still have quite a few engineers and scientists in our labs thinking about what is the next cool technology that we can do. Perfectly legitimate, and in fact extremely needed uh, in all respects. We also have marketing people traditionally staring at market analysis data to get a sense of where is the next big opportunity for us to go pursue. But you also have the ethnographers going out in the world and just studying people in the natural habitat to kind of derive new motivations and met needs that nobody else might have seen. Irrespective of where you start in the process, you have to find that center in order to create something that's worth, that's valuable. And that requires creating conversations between the disciplines representing those three circles in the diagram. So what I'm going to talk about now is sort of how all this stuff lines up and how it actually creates a systematic process in the company that allows us to start with those insights on the left-hand side and end up essentially with a platform that realizes those on the right-hand side. So typically, we may start up with a market opportunity. For example, a statement that 90% of the world's population has no access to computers, which is, if you look for growth, what can we do in that marketplace to capture some of that? What can we do to add 1 billion users to the population of computer users today? That's sort of the purview of the market space. Now, the way to read the diagram is the label on top sort of talks about the phase in the process. <clears throat> the three circle diagram sort of reflects which of the three conversations is sort of dominant in the discussion. The place in Y talks about what actually is going on, what work gets done. The stuff on the bottom talks of which disciplines are sort of in the driver's seat. And then the little kind of sheet of paper kind of reflects how do we make that information actionable to the next stage. So in this case, this may be a statement of a market segment we'd like to pursue. What we then often do is we send our ethnographers into that market. We go find individuals or families that represent the market segment they're after. So this is where a lot of the field work happens. A lot of the analysis, the synthesis, um, the, with the intent to really peel out the and identify the user goals of people in that marketplace. So we get a sense of which experience to design for. The way we typically consume that is by a method called personas. And personas are these made up descriptions of fictitious archetype users that are representative for the market segment. The reason personas work is they create empathy by the team that is going to take control next um, in terms of designing experience that solves the problem. To give you an example, it is very difficult to get motivated by a bar chart. And if you think about the work we're doing in healthcare and in older care, you probably have all seen the statistics about the aging of the population and people dealing with Alzheimer's and cognitive decline as they get older. When you see that graph, you can say from a marketing viewpoint, we have a place to go focus. There's a real opportunity here for technology to come to the rescue and improve life of those people. What's more powerful is to create a description of one person trying to make it through their day who suffers from Alzheimer's disease. Now you have a real problem. You feel empathy for that person. What can we do to make that person's life better? And that's sort of the reason why personas work at Intel. They sort of create an action and call to action by people um, designing experiences. 
which is the next stage. It's what we call user experience design or user experience definition. It's where we take the personas as our target. And the goal becomes designing experiences that make the persona's problems go away as much as possible. This is really the creative process where the brainstorming occurs, people come up with the cool concepts, and all the kind of stuff that you typically hear about when you talk about innovation and creativity. Except there's a whole process around it to inform it and steer it in a way that makes sense and actually gives some real relevance to it. So typically what we do there is we do the brainstorming, we create what's called usage models, quite a bit of talk about usage models in these conferences from Intel. Um, we do storyboards, we develop scenarios, but all of it has to do with users interacting with an experience. We try to understand what do we need to deliver, what do we need to make possible so that those people's problems can solve. It's also typically where we start creating early models and early prototypes. And I'll refer back later to an example uh, on the floor called the kitchen window demo, if you haven't seen it yet. It's one of those early concept prototypes that was inspired by this research but it starts creating a conversation around how computing could be different in completely different environments. This is the preview and the role of the domain of the industrial designers and the interaction designers for the most part. This is where they do their magic. What comes out of that is sort of a user level description of what we want to make possible called user requirements. Still very much as a way of revealing the benefit to the target users that we're at. Now if you shift all this stuff to the left side so we can make more plays, then what happens is we get our solutions architects that really do an in-depth, top to bottom, left to right analysis of how, what, is, what is involved by the whole ecosystem to deliver those experiences. So this is where you got solutions architect and platform architects and so forth. This is also where user level definitions of goodness for the system we're imagining are systematically translated into workloads, into uh, engineering type of specifications, weights, size, envelopes, thermal envelopes, and those kinds. Now the importance of this is by the time you end up with your technical requirements, which are typical engineering quantified requirements that are measurable with bolt meters and logic analyzers and other instruments, you can trace back and you can say that this technical requirement was informed by the specific user need and the specific user benefit. Now again, given the ecosystem that we're in, typically they sort of fall apart into marching orders both to Intel, what we need to build, but then also what, what marching orders to the rest of the industry. What are all the pieces that need to come together, including the pieces that we ourselves do not develop in-house. And then completely not to scale, sort of the whole development phase, which is where all the hard engineering works, make all the magic occur, make all the magic work. And then finally the launch and go to market plan. Hopefully again with our ecosystem partners to make sure that all the pieces are together um, and provide a solution. So that sort of gives you a sense of the end-to-end -end process which I think we haven't quite done before to connect all these dots from studying people in India or China all the way to a product or a platform or requirements being set and the platforms coming out of our uh, development. So quick status across Intel. Uh, these methods are more and more shaping our platforms as we speak. So a lot of the stuff you saw today and yesterday in the keynotes, a lot of that work, although it hasn't been talked about explicitly, is sort of embedded into the platforms that we then give back to the industry. It also means, as a developer, it's relatively easy to realize the experiences that we imagine and we validated because our platform pieces have been designed to add up to those experiences. So I think by buying into the end platforms, you sort of buy in and automatically get the benefit from all this work that we've done that led up to those. Now for some of those, the platforms, we sort of focus very roughly on what we call value vectors. Which things, if we add up, to the platform or provide to the platform. We'll just provide goodness to it. For example, you all know about some trigger notes about connectivity, uh, long battery life, lightweight, those kind of things. It's essentially what makes a good laptop to begin with. So if we keep working on those things called value vectors, we be guaranteed that they will increase the satisfaction of consumers of laptops. We also do a lot more detailed user experience work that actually goes into more the ease of use and also the desirability aspects of those kind of things. Just to understand to what extent are the driver requirements on our platform that we haven't comprehended yet. Specifically as we go into new markets like emerging markets, which deal with different infrastructure, uh, a lot of deficiencies in infrastructure, but also different social structures in which things have to live, uh, and so forth. We also apply this much more broadly now from exploration or pathfinding all the way to products that come out of the marketplace. So we're sort of broadening and widening. 
so this is now applied, and there are teams doing this work in pretty much every platform group at Intel, including the labs. So home, enterprise, mobility, and health, and then across emerging markets and mature markets. But there's a lot more studying of people going on that ultimately gets designed and user experiences for those markets that ultimately informs our platform roadmaps. So let me give you a quick example here. Um, by the way, this is not a committed product, so I'm going to preface this saying um, that the front. It's called it's something we call kitchen window. And in essence, what it was was how do we get the computer really out of the den? And to participate in families coordinating their family lives. And as you all know, that doesn't happen in the house. It happens with kids with cell phones, it happens with husbands at work, it happens with spouses somewhere else, and those kind of things. So we sort of took a challenge to say, how can we deliver an experience or make it a vision experience that would be centered around this family coordination, but delivered in a way that becomes accessible to pretty much normal people that aren't necessarily computer savvy and deliver it in a way that it really is in tune with the realities of what family life today looks like. So underlying this was quite a bit of family research on how they coordinate their activities. I mean, you all have heard about the prototypical soccer mom and how you coordinate life and it goes through the day, things change through the day, but you make it happen. So you see on the left-hand side of the wall hanging a big display, it's called kitchen window. That really delivers that experience. And the whole metaphor about the kitchen window is built around the family calendar. In fact, um, it, um, there's a prototype on the floor that I would definitely suggest if you haven't done already, so, so, so uh, you go visit and you get an illustration for it. And do feel free to interact with it and get a feel for just how intuitive and how easy it is to kind of deal with that kind of, uh, kind of experience. <clears throat> so anyway, back to the family calendar. So the whole metaphor is centered around the family calendar. So you can potentially be out taking a picture with a cell phone and you can send it to your essentially your kitchen window. What happens is that the picture automatically gets associated with the day on which it was received by a family calendar. So you sort of have an anchor to remember family events around again the time when they occurred. You can pull those up, everything's navigatable with your finger, so you can take a day, you can blow the day up, you can pick a picture, you can make it big and look at it. You can also have post-it notes, this notion of um, straight here. Easy to write post-it notes, so you can just write notes to yourself, you can write notes to other family members in the, in the community that you're in. What may happen is, if they're somewhere else, that, that post-it note may appear as a text message on their cell phone, because again, the reality is people won't be huddled around this thing all the time. Families are very dispersed in geography. Um, it also has capability for video conferencing, or telephone, video telephone calls, very easy between people you typically deal with. It's also realizing that the home is a multi-person environment. It's very easy for you to say, well, I'm Johnny. Just bring up my calendar and bring up the stuff I want to see. But then if another person wonders about it, they can say, well, I'm mom, and I'm interested in other things that Johnny may be interested in. So it has this multi-person uh, appeal as well. So rather than me trying to explain this on a piece of paper or a PowerPoint concept, I definitely would encourage you to go see the thing in the, what's called the Innovations Around the World Zone and get an in-depth view of what this kind of thing is. Now this is what we call an experience demonstration or an experience prototype. Its purpose is to focus primarily on the interaction between the human being and the experience that technology can deliver. So again, in many ways we're sort of delaying the question about the technology that's going to need to deliver this. There's potentially a variety of implementations possible uh, around this kind of thing, with different cost structures and different kind of things associated with it. What it has done each time we saw it show this demonstration to anybody, it starts a conversation about well, what else can it do and wouldn't it be cool if it could do this. So the conversation is clear around user experience, desirability, user satisfaction, what do people imagine they can do with this, which is the purpose of this kind of things. It's less sparking discussions about, well, is it using this latest technology about this and what if it could use this and that following in technology terms. So it's very effective at sparking conversations around user experience and what's desirable. And again, I talked about the process sort of in an abstract fashion. We followed this process pretty much to, the, to a T. We started out by doing research in people's homes to get a sense of how do families coordinate, what problems do they have, where does communication break down, what gives it pleasure in doing this, what's the frustration in doing this, what have existing products not delivered in many ways because there's maybe tied to the computer that's sitting in the wrong place in the house that doesn't allow them to participate in this ballet that families go through in order to coordinate themselves. 
Then we went through an elaborate ideation phase to kind of really pick out and say, given those goals and those frustrations and those needs, what can we deliver that will sort of respond to that in the best possible way? So again, we sort of ignore the technology feasibility question to a large extent. And then we create an embodiment that you can see on the floor that really kind of allows us to interact and really get to the next level of questions and explore that more. So this is roughly what it looks like. Um, if you can actually pull it up and down on the wall because short kids may be able to just, uh, I mean, they may not be able to reach that high and they would like them to participate as well. But it was really designed, ease of use was paramount to it. And in fact, once you translate that down, it ends up creating quite a few requirements in how people interact. It needs to be very natural, very intuitive. Um, we have the impression to not make it look and feel like any traditional PC. So there's no logging in, none of that other stuff you typically have to deal with. It's just there, just like your refrigerator is, and the, the calendar that maybe is on your refrigerator. We organize it the way families organize. We didn't force them to say, well, you have to really kind of get the family together, and you have to change the family processes in order for make, to make this fit. We make the technology fit to the way a family would typically operate, which I think is important in this game. And then all of this is based on actual interaction, speech, touch, those kind of things. So that's pretty much the sort of the prepared overview of the state of user centered innovation at Intel. Uh, so what I tried to do is give you a sense of the end-to-end -end process. How does all this user-centered work lead to influencing real platforms like that we see from Intel? So you sort of have a sense of what's behind this. Uh, I also gave you an example um, with the kitchen window that has led to an experience uh, prototype. When you go to the innovation around the world zone, so just about every product that you see that a classmate PC, the Intel community PC, and so forth, are all created using this kind of processes. Just picked out this one for some reason. I think the other ones have been highlighted more already. Uh, and this one, I think, is kind of for the one. So, with that, I think it's probably fair to open it up for questions. Hey, it's over here. Um, uh, how young would the kitchen window skew? Like, uh, is it a three year old or a four year old? Yeah, I mean, it's exactly the, the kind of questions that we always get, which is, well, what if you can do this? What if you can do this? So again, this is, the, the realm is, it's kind of such a space of possibility. And if we think that there's some value in very, very young kids to be able to interact with this by kind of drawing on it, and sort of drawings, simply because we can now have them participate in that, I think it's a very, very powerful kind of feature, feature. But it's sort of part of that family. Um, keep in mind, again, this is not a product. This is purely an experiential exploration prototype. I could easily imagine kids doing the drawings on that screen, and that person would have to say something to grandma. And then grandma's kitchen window would just, this thing would just appear on the day that the kid created it and sort of create a connection between children and the family that they're part of. So to, to us it's a good example of how technology helps people come closer together as a family as opposed to what technology may typically do, which is create barriers because they are looking down at their little personal phone and sort of the connection seems sometimes broken. Uh, this sort of seems to encourage people to connect better. I'd just like to add that those of you who are curious, the demo he's speaking is literally out the door in this corner of the second floor. You see a little collection of uh, digital home type projects and stuff, and it's facing it's way of facing the uh, lobby area. So you can go check it out back here. Another question? I think it's fair to say that you can sort of uh, split the space between incremental adjustments and improvements versus more radically rethinking of what computing can be. This spans essentially the whole spectrum. Except it, it feels less pronounced when you're sort of doing the next generation of something. If you think about manageability and the, the power efficiency, a lot of that was based on research we've done with IT accounts and with people that actually care about these kind of spaces. It feels a little bit less perhaps revolutionary than these completely new concepts that sort of shatter or potentially shadow what we think about what we think about a normal computer. Um, also, emerging markets, typically it's easier to tell the story because people can see the differences once you talk about the differences in social structures and how people think about what productivity means in the spaces. I mean, it's easier to see the differences. And you can actually argue perhaps in emerging and in mature markets, it may actually be to some degree harder for this to sort of start exploring more differences. Uh, 
uh, in what's possible. But I think we're applying it across the range for incremental improvements as to how come, what's the next version of something? How can it be better? How can it be more student to users' needs? All the way to uncovering needs of people that have never used technology. Because we talk about using, but in many cases, a lot of people have never used anything. So you have to sort of start from ground zero because they can't relate to an experience they had before. So the technique sort of adjusts based on the level of um, exposure they had to technology versus a lot versus not. And also, if you think about IT environments, people know quite a bit about technology. If you think about consumers, typically they won't have to care about technology, they just worry about what, what, can, what they can do with it. Is there a problem then when you do this with people who are used to doing functional specification and stuff and trying to get with the users? Is they used to saying, oh, we'll specify it in terms of the hardware, the requirements to get them to go back and look at it as a wider problem set? So with the users, should typically try to express requirements in terms of the benefits that it provides to the users, like the why do I care? So keep asking why until it gets interesting in their space. And in many ways, users don't really care at first hand about technology. They just want to have a problem they want to solve. They may have another person on the East Coast that they want to sort of keep track of or provide a better way to age in place and those kind of things. So they, that's their primary goal as to what problem are you solving for me. And that's sort of the purpose of this is first identify the relevant problems to go focus on, both in what's wrong with the existing product set that we may have or how can it be improved, and then also what problem, problem opportunities haven't been addressed yet that might provide a real uh, interesting new direction for us to go. And I have a question. When you're doing research for the teaching window, very often in the US and Europe, or did you do research in other countries like Asia? This one was only done in, I think, the US for the most part. Okay. Um, and it's always interesting as how, once you have a solution, how would it transcend or how it might it might map into other geographies or other cultures? Um, that's what we call the scaling. How do you take a concept that we developed, invest in, it, and then imagine how it might fit? And I think we you sort of use a variation of the process I talked about, we still want to sort of make sure that it fits our ethnographic insights about the geographies and also the infrastructure deficiencies that might exist in those geographies. But you have to do it smartly. You can't just say we have a solution that's kind of blasted across the globe. So I think it's a variation of this process that we use um, in terms of making sure that we the solution with adaptation will fit the needs of that local geography and those local Again, not commit as a product yet. So it's pure an exploratory vehicle um, that sort of we run through the process and it led to this creation of this. Um, I picked it out because I think it's very compelling because it's sort of it's an extreme example that sort of moves away from what people think typically think about as a computer, computer user. And in fact, what's interesting is each time anybody touches it, um, it starts that rich conversation, which I think is very exciting. So we'll see, you'll probably see quite a few more of those in the near future. And Future because I think it's a technique that really is very useful. Now, in terms of what may happen product-wise, it could go multiple ways, right? This could inspire maybe a derivative that is possible in the next six months to a year that may not look like this at all, but maybe some low-hanging fruit we may start um, implementing or may see to see appear. Um, but maybe it sort of sets a vector on what computer what computing can be and how it can change taking these approaches. Thank you.